Men are gonna come along and want to teach you things. Doesn't make them any smarter. You just let them blow by, and you go on ahead and do just what and how you feel like. Someday you're gonna be all alone. So you need to figure out how to take care of yourself. Tell the readers of life how it feels to be a girl. Among all those men. I don't mind it. Chess isn't always competitive. Chess can also be beautiful. You're an orphan, Beth. I'm fine being alone. I feel safe in an entire world of just 64 squares. Our creativity and psychosis often go hand in hand. Or for that matter, genius and madness. On Tuesday, The Queen's Gambit walked away with an impressive 18 Emmy nominations, including for Outstanding Limited or Anthology Series, lead actress for Anya Taylor-Joy, and a string of creative arts categories. The Netflix limited series from writer-director Scott Frank follows Beth Harmon, an ambitious but troubled chess prodigy. By following her personal story, as well as the drama of the competitive matches, including the final match in Russia, the filmmakers attracted both chess enthusiasts and those unfamiliar with the game, giving the series its broad appeal. Joining us on Behind the Screen are three of the Emmy nominees from the series, editor Michelle Tessero, sound designer Wiley Stateman, and composer Carlo Rafael Rivera. The trio previously worked with Scott Frank on his Western drama Godless, and Carlo Rafael Rivera won an Emmy for the series' main title theme music. Wiley Stateman is also a nine-time Oscar nominee, including for his frequent collaborator Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The Queen's Gambit itself already collected a string of honors during this past award season, with Tessera winning an American Cinema Editor's Eddie Award and Stateman earning a pair of Golden Reel Awards from the Motion Picture Sound Editors in the categories for Dialogue and ADR and Effects and Foley. Additionally, its score collected several awards, including one from the Society of Composers and Lyricists. I'm Carolyn Giardino. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. So thanks for joining me today, and congratulations on your Emmy nominations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the first question is, I wanted to ask each of you how familiar you are with the game of chess, or were you going into this project? Michelle? Oh, no. (laughs) I mean, yes, I've played fairly rudimentary, but like I never really got past playing my brother, which who always beat me, so I just sort of gave up. (laughs) But yeah. That, that's my experience with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a player, <laughs> chess player. <with> us. <laughs> and we have, we have a big, almost life-size chess set in my sort of backyard garden. And it's a game that, uh, that is impossible to master unless you're a little bit like our character, Beth, who could go into that space and, uh, and think five moves in advance. But it's, it's a small, it's a board game about warfare. And, and dominance and, and real estate. It's, it's, uh, it, it predates Monopoly and, and is far more interesting in, in so many ways. I'm a professional. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. I, I, the, the joke I've been saying is that before I started working on this project, I, I was bad at chess. And now that I've been playing chess on chess.com for the last like few years, um, I know how bad I am, you know. So, but it doesn't mean I've improved at all, you know. Thank God, though, Queen's Gambit isn't really about chess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the surreal part of it all, you know. It was, it was scary. I think the, the scariest thing was that it was daunting that when, when Scott sent the email saying, this is the thing we're probably going to be doing with Netflix, I read the book and I proceeded to freak out. You know, I, I was like, oh, my God, this is how. how? And, and what I love about what Scott did is that he was very clear. He was clear from the beginning. This this is how where the ship was going. And I we all followed along and and just helped him get to shore. And it was just an amazing ride. It was an education for me, without a doubt. So 
Well, let's talk about how you created the um, the drama and the tension in the competitive matches. Michelle, in the past, you've likened this to cutting dialogue scenes, but you had the game board itself. You had incredible performances and reactions. Um, would you talk us through um, the final match and how you created that tension? Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I can remember the final match. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think it's all about the different parallels that are happening at the same time. I mean, you have, you know, obviously her and Borgov and and you have the audience and the sort of austere feeling of the place, you know, um, that great hall that you're in. And um, and the running commentary is kind of helping you know where, where you're at so that visually we can really focus on just, you know, the looks on people's faces, you know, feeling like you don't know what's going to happen, you know, feeling the expectations or anticipation of the audience. And so it sort of all kind of helps add to that so that when we are telling you, okay, you know, because really in the beginning of it, you're it's just the setup of where everybody is and how everybody's listening to it and that everybody around the world is listening to this game. And and then the next thing you know, the next real beat is is Borgov getting up for the adjournment. And so then you're like, oh, <laughs> so you don't you know that she's playing the opening as a Queen's Gambit and, and all that. But you don't really see what's happening on the board leading up to that adjournment. You just know that they get to a place and he makes a move that's unexpected. And then what happens there is the biggest tension, which is the tension we've been sort of leading up to all throughout uh, the series is is she going to fall off the wagon or not? And that's basically why why this is more important is because every time we've seen her with Borgov, she's completely fallen apart. You know, she's and so I think that's that's where the actual real drama and tension is. I mean, you're gonna we're gonna sit there and play chess after when she gets when she gets back to the board and on the, and the, the guys call her and help her and try to help her figure it out, but. But ultimately, you know, you don't know because of her past, like how, how, what she's going to do. And with that in mind, would you talk about how you made the decisions as far as when you would stay on their facial expressions and when you would show the board? Because there were parts where you really didn't show much of the game at all. You know, <laughs> that's hard to answer only because it's I'm looking at the footage and I'm just sort of deciding, oh, Oh, that's a really great piece there. Where can I fit that in? And when I'm looking at everybody's, I don't know, I it just, it's what I have in my head that I, where I feel like I want to be. So it's, it's hard to say that I, I don't really make logical decisions when I'm putting something together sometimes. <laughs> it's just like the little movie in my head when I read the thing in the script and after I've seen everything that they've shot, you know, as a whole, you know, it just sort of comes to me, oh, oh right now, you know, now, now I'm with th this audience going this way. Now I'm on this side of uh, the audience going that way. Let's set up everyone outside and the big ambiance. And then I'm going to hone in on Beth and Borgov. So it's just sort of like the feeling that I want to build. And but, you know, I, I don't know how, to, how else to express that. Would you talk about shaping her performance? Her face is so expressive. Yeah, she is very expressive. So, you know, a little goes a long way with her. And I think that, you know, she she gives you a lot. So you don't really have to, you know, and almost if she really didn't have too much of an express expression on her face, it still does something. So I, I think that, um, you know, always leading up to the adjournment, I kind of wanted to make her feel like she's nervous that something else is going to happen because you do want to get to that hotel and feel like something else might happen, you know. And then once we get back and she's feeling good after she speaks to her friends, you know, you want her to be in that, uh, I guess, phase two of the Henry Clay um uh, God, finale that she plays with Beltic. You know, she's like all of a sudden a different person and she kind of knows, she thinks she knows what she's, what, what she's doing, you know, because she's had, she has this blueprint. So, yeah. <laughs> and Michelle also, um, 
we had done an interview about this um, series a while ago. And at the time you, you liken cutting the chess matches to cutting dialogue. And um, I was hoping maybe you could elaborate a little bit about that and how that drove your, you know, your choices. Well, I mean, you know, when you're looking at a match, it's a call and response, right? And there's an attitude behind certain sections of moves and reactions to moves, which to me is sort of similar to when you're either arguing with someone or you're having a, a deep conversation. So I go back to my days of cutting hours upon hours of people talking to each other and in treatment, where that's all you had is two people sitting across from each other talking, you know, and you had to create a rhythm with that dialogue. And so that's when, when, when I said, mentioned earlier that I sort of cut with my ears first, that's sort of, I, I think about it in my head, what, you know, what, what is that rhythm? And then I, I try to manifest that with what I have. So, you know, in the case of, uh, I always bring I always bring this one up because there's a, there's like almost no sound there's there's only music in the second part is is a last Kentucky match between Beltic and and Beth and you know how the beginning sort of is a flip of of the end you know and how and how that that rhythm happens it's like you know it it seems like Harry knows exactly what he's going to say and he's just waiting for her to stop talking in order to, to say it. And when I'm saying talking, it's like making their, the chess move, you know, where she's in a reactive mode and so she's always sort of looking and, and then hesitating before she does what, she, before she makes her move. And then after, when she goes to the bathroom and takes the pill and sort of tries to regroup and she comes back and she's feeling confident, it's sort of exactly the opposite. So I'm playing with manipulating the time there uh, of how people react to how they react to one another in order to tell you the story of how of the drama of what is happening so um what is that even but a manipulation of time to tell story Wiley, let's talk about the sound. Um, there wasn't a lot of dialogue in those m matches at all, but the sounds you used for just when they moved the pieces and certainly the clock and the rhythm that you used created so much tension. Would you talk about that? Yeah, you know, um, we had the clocks uh, because most of this type of chess is played against the clock. And some of the games were called what's called speed chess, which is played against absolute um, uh, uh, frenetic time. And so for those, we had great pieces, tut, tut, you know, tut, tut, uh, classical gas. And these are really powerful rhythmic jazz pieces that we were able to sort of incorporate in both the mix and in the sound design uh, by, by popping the cuts alongside of what Michelle was doing. And, um, you know, this is really um, much more than just about chess. It's, uh, it's about, um, I guess the best way to explain it is it's about a woman who can go inside of herself and find these superpowers. And then she's kind of a flawed character as well, whether it's drugs or whether it's her sexuality or whatnot. And so she just becomes a very interesting character. And then you set that to, to score, which Carlos did a beautiful job with, or you set that to songs. When, when Anya dances to Fever, you know, or, uh, or Venus, it's mesmerizing. And it's really just a, it's a mixing technique where we sort of follow the camera, where we follow the action, where we follow the rhythms of, of, of the song and the rhythms of the cut. So it's a, it's a very fun film to watch. We're really excited how well it was received. And, and um, I think that rhythm and patterns and, um, and that sort of thing adds a tremendous amount to this kind of uh, storytelling. Carlos, for the score, um, when you started working on this project, what was your approach of what you wanted the score to be from a creative standpoint? Well, I think it, Scott was the one who really wanted it to be a piano-based score. He was the first one to say, I want this to be, if we can pull it off, make it a completely piano-based score all the way through, all six, seven episodes. Um, and that was the intention. And so my first drafts of the main title were, were piano only with some timpani and I was just trying to add some color, but mostly piano. And I even thought of the piano, maybe since it has to be a piano only, 
we could do it like a choir, you know, like set up like you have the sopranos on towards the left if you're facing them, you know, the altos and then the tenors and then we go down and sound range, right? Towards the basses on the right. So I wanted, I, I, it helped me build the piano landscape throughout the, the whole show in a way that's different from what would be a regular piano. Um, but that was all because Scott wanted it to be a piano-based score. The thing is that once we got, we, we were kind of working chronologically. So all my first missteps were, were all happening during episode one while, while Beth was in the basement with Mr. Scheibel and playing all these games. And it felt like piano was appropriate and some sparse instrumentation. But once she got adopted in episode two, just that scene of her driving to the new place, piano didn't seem to fit anymore the screen, you know, the way it was shot, the colors were, had changed. And so I, I started to realize I had to add color, you know, to it. I also found out that Bill Horberg, the producer, loved flute or played flute. So the first instrument I started bringing in was flute. So I would stay hired on the project. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but it really did, it started to help to add a little pointillism, a little color. And then, then the idea was kind of born of, of continuing that growth instrumentally along with Beth's character to get to the final episode where, you know, it's all orchestral. Her reality is colored with the orchestra uh, fully. And um, whereas in episode one, the only time you hear orchestra is when she's looking at the ceiling and playing the games. Kind of like when you're a kid and you kind of have all these fantasies of the things you're going to get to do when you grow up, you know, they're all fully realized. And so it was always orchestral on the ceiling, but her reality was piano. So we're going to listen to the cue called Take It, It's Yours, which is the scene where Beth wins the final match. Would you introduce that cue? Sure. That was... um that was the first time I realized how powerful the story could be was when I saw it assembled. I mean, I cried with, you know, with the scene as it was, just the way it was cut, the way it was acted, with the sound as it was rolling in, and there was no music, and it was just so powerful. And so I felt like it was a gift, you know, to just be able to score a scene that felt like the kind of thing I grew up watching like Rocky, you know, even though he doesn't win, he kind of won anyway, when in, in the first Rocky movie and uh, because he went the distance, you know, and uh, or Hoosiers, I, I realized it was a sports movie at that moment. So this piece is uh, is sort of that's kind of celebration where it's just really the the joy of actually of having the win and, and and being able to go from characters from the important characters throughout the story and be able to touch upon them. Uh, from scene to scene towards the end. So it's called uh, Take It, It's Yours. And then the final scene, uh, when she walks through the park and she sees uh, the others playing chess, would you introduce that cue? Sure. Basically, the, the what's interesting about that one for me, it's special because that was like the second piece I wrote. And it was, um, it was I wrote the main title and then I wrote this piece based on the novel on on how she did that walk through the park. At the, and it felt very much like a like a like a fresh new start. And musically, what I like about it is that you don't hear any of that music throughout the whole show. It just happened there. And so when I presented it to Scott, um, he had heard it when it was like a demo before the thing was shot, before anything had happened. I was kind of hesitant thinking, well, it doesn't belong anymore because we've developed all of this new music for the show and um, it doesn't fit. But somehow it still found a place and it, and, it, and it felt right. So I sent it, I pressed send on the email with the link 
and cross my fingers and and he said yes which is you know the greatest feeling of all so um yeah it's called sigrayam or let's play the crafts work together so well. Would all of you talk about how uh, you collaborated? How frequently were you talking during production and post-production? I think we, I mean, we began talking as soon as we got that email. Hey, this is our, (laughs) this is our next project. Um, But no, yeah, I mean, we, we were pretty much talking right away during the beginning. I mean, mostly, you know, Wiley has a lot of ideas and a lot of input of like how, you know, how we feel about the script, uh, the conversations we've, we've, we've had with Scott, um, you know, obviously Carlos is starting way back, you know, before either Wiley and I have started anything, you know, so we've, by the time, you know, I'm, uh, we're getting ready to, uh, to start production, you know, I'm, I've listened to maybe 10 or 11 demo tracks, you know, and actually that, that, that final cue that the Sigrayam, I remember listening to that going, this doesn't sound like the, like the show. It's like, it sounds too happy. (laughs) He's like, no, no, no. And Scott's like, no, no, no. This is what, this is the feeling that I want to end on. So that, that was a good move to keep, to keep that because he really loved that cue. So, and, and yeah, somehow it still felt fit within the palette, but maybe didn't, didn't need to. So, that's just an example of like how early we're already talking about these things throughout. And, and obviously, um, you know, while I'm assembling, I'm, I'm sort of, as soon as Scott has had his say about it and I'm kind of putting a reel together or whatever, you know, I'm trying to, you know, when Wiley and his team are ready for it and Carlos is ready for it, you know, I, I'll share that on picks. They, they may not get like the actual tracks, but, you know, Scott is a very much of, of an open book that everybody should be on the same page and things work best when we all can see the process as it moves forward and see how we got to see by seeing what A and B were. So, um, and so they were always seeing the different versions and until, you know, Scott would do his pass with me and then we would push it forward to them and and then continue. You know, they would then officially become a part of that process, but quite early. (laughs) Yeah, this is a project we finished in the age of COVID. So we were very dependent on uh, uh, means of communication. Uh, We we all sat in uh, geo-isolated environments, but uh, very much involved in the final mix. And, um, you know, using Source Connect and Evercast and PIX and all of these collaborative tools, we're able to stay in far better touch than even sometimes if we were just down the hall from each other. You know, uh, these tools are, are a wonderful way to sort of remove the walls that you have in a typical cutting room. <laughs> you know, everyone has an office, but when everybody has a collaboration tool and, uh, you know, and a way to send text messages and stuff, it can be really, really wonderful. I, I, I didn't uh, think, I thought that COVID was a a feature, not a bug, to helping us really get our heads around this project and and uh, and work together, yeah, remotely. Carlos, where did you record the score? How did you record the score? Well, uh, um, pre-COVID, I had had musicians come and sit on a couch I have back here and uh, with a mic, and uh, and then you know for some of it, just add a little realism to the demos as they were being made. But once you know, COVID hit, obviously that ended and I had to get my demo skill set, like using libraries and, uh, improved. It just, that it forced a, a kind of a step up in the level of the demos that I was presenting. 
because we were not sure if we were going to get to record. And we got to record with the East Budapest or the, Art, the Budapest Art Orchestra in, 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 in Hungary. And um, uh, we were fortunate enough that the days we had set, it all happened by coincidence. We weren't expecting it. But the day that we were set to record is a day that they allowed uh, for the musicians to be in the room and record you know, the orchestra. So we were able to get a live orchestra to record this. And I do think it elevated what would have potentially been like just a demo kind of base score uh, for the show to, it added that depth. I don't, it's really hard to talk about, but it added kind of a sense of dimension and space that, that otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have been there. And I do think it, it changed how people perceived the score for sure. And the story more importantly. Wiley, do you want to talk about how you approach the sound in the, um, you know, throughout the series, depending on her state of mind and the situation, for example, um, when she has a devastating loss, things like that? Anya did a marvelous job bringing depth to this character. So um, what we did in terms of sound was to kind of go inside of her head often. And that was done through techniques that Michelle was really the architect of, and Scott, of course, um, you know, wanted this to be a movie that was far deeper and far more um, interesting than a, and than the, the trajectory of her chess career. So we are emotionally very attached to our character and all of our characters. That there's a mother daughter, there's a, a woman coming of age. There's some really wonderful threads that were. Uh, were the backbone of, of sound and music. And I think Carlos and I sort of share this love that music is sound. Sound effects are not, you know, a foreign element. Everything has to coalesce with the dialogue and with the cutting patterns in order for it to be an effective uh, audience, um, attractive uh, work of art, you know? So that's kind of um, our, our feeling was to be, again, very much um, adding to the palette things that made uh, 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 for an interesting experience for the audience. And to, to kind of track this in a period sense, you know, we're, we're really the 1960s and 1970s. That gave us uh, some really nice advantages uh, in terms of sound. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's a testimony, I think, to Scott uh, Frank's vision and uh, Netflix's persistent nature to make films that are our passion projects for their uh, directors and their producers uh, that we had a chance to make this film. So it was a very collaborative, very crafty experience. Well, you, you just learned about your nominations a few hours ago. I just can't believe that, that this is a reality I'm living. I got to be honest with you because, you know, so many people take these moments for granted, I guess. And then, but I'm a fan of all of this first. And so getting getting a chance to, you know, read the nominees and who I'm nominated with, it's like, it, I feel like I'm living a lie or something like this weird, like, I'm going to wake up and it'll be like, you know, a, a different gig altogether. And so I'm always, I'm always blown away by the fact that I'm getting to talk to you, Carolyn, or, you know, having these conversations with the people I'm talking, you know, I haven't been able to say this, but it's important also that not only do I feel very lucky to have been able to work with Michelle, but Wiley truly has been a mentor to me because I've been I've sort of only worked with him for the last three projects I had done and so Scott says this all the time but we all call him Obi-Wan Kenobi for a reason and you can look him up on on IMDb and, and see the credits and the things he's worked on and but he takes the time to call and say Carlos I have some thoughts and I'm like okay go ahead you know and and I and I've been listening attentively every single time he's called and and some of the stuff that we get to do and to I realize that it's actually an orthodox, the fact that we are collaborating sound and music. When I hear now that I've been doing this for a little bit, so many stories of like, you know, the sound will battle it out with this music on the stage. And it's like, that's not how this works. And being able to work with someone at his level and I, like a nerdy thing, I'll say, just like totally to nerd out. There's a moment in the final game after Beth looks at the ceiling and she sees like, you know, she has that moment, the, the superhero moment. And then she looks back down. The first move she does is 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 this. Like she goes, 
But Wiley adds like a whip sound, which is impossible. He goes whoosh, like that. Who? Why? But it works. And and that going along with the music is the kind of stuff that kind of turns me on. It's like, oh my god, dude, this is so exciting! Like I get like I nerd out. Most of the sounds that Carlos is talking about are, are really just velocity sounds. So what we try and do is develop a, a vocabulary for for picture cuts and for camera action and uh, and for punctuation. So um, sound effects and sound design can be very effective as a punctuation tool. What the sound is 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 much. Uh, is far maybe more, more interesting or less interesting, but the application of it and the synchronization of it is really what's critical. So if it if it leads the cut or if it lags the cut, it has a completely different feel. And and with music, it's always who's got the downbeat? Is it going to be the composition or is it going to be something that we're going to use to give us an introduction to the composition? So. Um, and that's why I think Carlos said that sometimes it feels like a battle because sometimes it truly is because people aren't talking to each other. But Carlos and I are always saying, hey, uh, you're going to jump in here. So we're going to lead that and comment on it with something maybe in the sound design or we're just going to leave it alone. And, you you know, please, if you need something, Carlos, just ask and it's there. So that's what collaboration is all about between um, music and, and sound effects. Yeah, and we're always talking about it. You know, it, I mean, it starts with with the picture too. It's like, okay, I know that here we're we're gonna want Carlos to kind of take over, or you know, maybe Wiley can do this, you know, this section of it. And even when they're all together, I mean, I'm always because I think the way they do in terms of music and sound being the same thing, sound is music music is sound, um, that when I'm cutting, because I cut with my ears, mostly, <laughs> not with my eyes, I start with my ears. So it it always has a feeling that, that will usually, ever since I started cutting, ends up working out for everybody, you know, as, oh, that kind of fits, you know, and that, that rhythmically works. So, so that, that sort of helps as well. And, you know, I'll say two things. One, the Emmys are a very inclusive um, award, uh, and it brings together our whole crowd. Uh, you know, uh, Tom Kramer, our music editor, the, the um, uh, Eric uh, Hirsch and, and um, Greg uh, Swatkowski, and, and, you know, editors and, and supervising editors in New York, sound editors. Um, this is a wonderful thing that really is very inclusive, the Emmy Awards. And, um, and two, I think, you know, just in terms of, of this kind of filmmaking, we're always sort of leading or lagging each other. So and that's what is, makes it such a lovely thing, I think, with music, Carlos, and, and with, with all of our teams, that we, we can go from, uh, from leading to following, you know, very quickly. And uh, we're very gentle with each other and very focused on trying to make uh, entertainment and, and make it as, as competently and as efficiently and as creatively as humanly possible. So uh, to be nominated for an Emmy is just the icing on the cake. And to see all of you uh, today, just through this, uh, through these little windows, is it feels like home. It's old home week. <laughs> Wiley, you started to do it, but would, uh, would each of you like to give shout outs to your teams? Well, I want to, I mean, my assistants were just the bomb. I mean, I, I, got through it with only two but there were two of one two of the best assistants in new york charlie green and philip kimsey pk and um and we had such a great stellar post staff that actually helps all of us um you know mick aniceto and um diana de and anthony um oh my gosh now i'm blanking um Anthony, Anthony and Gifford, um, you know, it's a small team because I remember, you know, Scott wanted us to try to keep it tight and, um, you know, it was basically the same size as the Godless team, but um, they're just amazing. And because we had all worked together before with some exceptions in the post staff, you know, it just made it a, a lot very easy and familiar and just we just had a good time and, you know, we're able to be creative and instead of just checking off the basic points. But yes, I, I thank them greatly. Yeah. And I'd love to give a shout out and a special thanks to, uh, to, well, for Rachel Chancy, who, who did the Foley and did do a beautiful job. Uh, but in particular for Greg uh, Swetlowski, who I think uh, 
really chaired the dialogue uh, portions of the sound editing and, and uh, Eric Hirsch, Eric Hain, uh, Leo Marcel. Uh, the team was small, but uh, everybody, including Roland Wenke, whose um, production mixing was just really spot on. Um, everybody really contributed and, uh, and worked to lead their individual departments. So. And we shouldn't forget um, uh, our VFX people. John Manja and, and Riss from um, from Chicken Bone. I mean, they they worked early on with us with the looks of the pieces um, on the ceiling. I mean, they it was a long time to get to where Scott was like, okay, yeah, I think. I mean, I literally months um, from October to June. That's a long time developing the looks and the movements and 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 yeah, I thank them as well. Uh, my shout out goes to uh, Tom Kramer. And thank you, uh, Wiley, for mentioning him, or else I would have never shouted him out. I'm just kidding. No. Uh, Tom Kramer is, uh, you know, for the first project I worked on, he was like my diaper changer, basically, as a music editor. And then uh, for the last ones now, we're kind of like have a really interesting relationship. And I'll leave it at that. No, I love the guy. And um, Tom Kramer, music editor, and then David Stahl and Asuka Ito, who did additional music and, and really helped in the team to really kind of get things to the end. I've been working with David for a little bit and Asuka is sort of newer. And um, for me, just like to learning this process in the industry has been like one of the great gifts of my life. And so I really do appreciate that David enabled me to do that, as well as Jeremy Levy, who orchestrated, uh, helped uh, get the music to the stands in Budapest. And... Um, and and of course Lawrence Manchester, who also got a nomination for mixing the score, the score. And his day job is like the Jimmy Fallon show or the Tonight Show. And I love that. That his day job is like it's pretty good. <laughs> so I'm grateful to them. So definitely a shout out to all of them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Carolyn. For sure. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs>